I guess that thing's echoing back through there. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, as we look into the Word this morning, we do ask that we might be able to present it as we should, as plain and clear and, and profitable as it can be presented, and also that it might honor and glorify what you've done for us. We thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for what eternal hope we have through him, in whose name we pray, amen. If I asked you to turn to some, into your Bibles to uh, talk about Pentecost, where would you turn? Most people would go to Acts chapter 1 or 2, wouldn't they? Well, let's go to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. That's a long way from the book of Acts. Exodus chapter 19. Now, I still got the same Bible I've had for about 20 some, maybe 30 some, I don't know how many years. And I'm maybe a little slow getting there because the pages stick together now. They're all frayed on the edges and the way they should be because we need to use God's Word. And uh, we do. And uh, if I'm going to be on, uh, you gonna you want to keep me in one place? Is that it? <laughs> well, I won't walk back and forth across here more then. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. It says, in the third month. Why is that there? The third month. Why is there a date ever given in the Scriptures? It's important. Every, is there any wasted words in the Scriptures? Are there any things in there put in there just to fill in so that it makes the book thicker? <laughs> you just heard what the Word of God was. Well, in the third month, what's the first month of the Jewish calendar? It's like a, uh, the, the car today, Nissan, I think is the way you pronounce that, isn't it, David? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. But what was in the middle of that month? That was Passover, wasn't it? So you got 15 days left. And in the third month, that would be, you have a whole month in there. So you got 30 more days. You had that 15 and 30. And where I went to school, that was uh, 45. I don't know about what it means when you went to school, but that's what it was where I was at. Now, if you got 45 days there in that second month, it says in the third month. It doesn't say at the beginning, does it? It says in the third month. So that's at least the second day. Well, let's add two together to that uh, 45. That comes out where I went to school, 47. Now, let's go on and read. In the third month when the children of Israel... I thought, that, is that Gentiles? No, it's children of Israel. That's who this is written to and who it's written for and about. In the third month when the children of Israel were going forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. So who's he talking to? And who's he talking about? He's talking to Israel, about the children of Israel, and whom? The house of Jacob. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you into myself. Now, there's a message right in, in that verse by itself on eagle's wings and how, do you ever know how a, an eagle teaches their young ones to fly? They get about so, they're about as big as mama, and uh, she gets them out there on the edge of the nest, and they look down, whoo, that's a long way down there. And what she do? She kicks them out of the nest. <laughs> and down they go <laughs> until she swoops down right under there and catches them on her wings and she takes them back up and she does that till they learn to fly well what was they going to do with the nation of Israel what was God going to do with the nation of Israel he's going to teach them to fly he's going to teach them what they were supposed to be now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed now, there's not a wasted word here. 
and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a... Now, wait a minute. See that little word, and? It starts the verse. What follows can't follow until it says what it did before in that previous verse. Go to Genesis chapter 1 sometime. Not right now, but in Genesis chapter 1, you've got all but three verses starting with the word and. In other words, what God just said, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. How can you have something without form and void if you don't have it created in the first place? You see how that and ties it together? It does that. In the first two chapters, go back to the last two chapters in the Bible and it'll be the same way. Now, isn't that it? Did that just happen? Oh, this Bible, it's it, it just like uh, Darwin's big theory of evolution. Every explosion I ever saw blew something apart. It didn't make it come together. Did you ever have a piston bust in your engine or something? It goes out through the side, your, your, your uh, rod goes out through the side, goes right, right, right through the block, doesn't it? It comes apart. Well, let's see what he said. He says, You be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel was to be a kingdom of priests. Now, if you've got a kingdom, what else you got to have? What do you got to have first before you can have a kingdom? You gotta have a king, don't you? Well, who was gonna be Israel's king? The Lord Himself was. God Himself. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now drop down to verse 10. So Moses goes down, he talks to them, and they all said, Whatever God says, we're gonna do. They are the liars. <laughs> and the people said unto Moses, Go unto or the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people. And sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And be ready against the, what? Third day. Now, we've got 47 days, don't we, so far? If you add three more days, how many is that? What was this, then? The first what? Pentecost. Now, what did God give them on Mount Sinai? I'm kind of watching this clock here, because uh, this got me tied down to... I spent... Uh, an hour and a half on each of these subjects at home, and I'm supposed to do this in 15 minutes each. Well, we'll see. Uh, I'm a farmer, and you can do a lot of things in a short time, but that's not one of them. Yeah. But uh, we've got 45 days here, and we've got two added to it in the third month, and then we've got three more days, so that makes it how many days? 50 days. And that's the first Pentecost. So what did God do on that first Pentecost? He gave them the law, didn't he? Now, who was it that he gave them to? He says to Moses, he says in verse 3, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. So who was it that was given that law? Israel and the house of Jacob. Where did he write it? He wrote it on a stone, didn't he? Have you ever heard anybody say in a business deal, is that thing written in stone? Guess where they get that? Right there. Do they want to admit that? No. Those same people are just like what Russ was talking about a while ago. They, they don't have the slightest idea what's going on. Turn to, uh, uh, let's go to Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-one right now. Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-one. And we want to see some things that God's going to promise to the nation of Israel. He says, Behold the days, Jeremiah 31, 31. Uh, I'm going to go a little fast, and if I leave you in the dust, that's fine. Uh, you'll catch up someday. <laughs> Behold, I don't know when, but uh, you might. Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. When was the new covenant to replace what the old covenant was? When the new one was offered. But what was the old covenant? It was the law. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So now we know what that covenant was. Because we go back when we read in, in, in uh, Exodus what that covenant was, that's the only place you can find that. 
When did he bring them out of Egypt? How many times did he bring them out of Egypt? Once. Which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Oh, boy. Who was the bride of Christ then? He said he was a husband unto them. Well, Israel is the bride of Christ. And that's the future, too. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on a stone tablet. Is that what it says? Isn't that what they try to tell you today in some of our denominational churches? It's not written on stone tablets. Where does they say where does God say He's going to write that for the nation of Israel? In their what? Hearts. And they will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no man no more, every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Every one of them is going to be saved. Hmm. All Israel is going to be saved. That's interesting, because the Apostle Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 11. Must be true. How many years between these times when, when God told this to Jeremiah and when Paul wrote that down? I haven't got the slightest idea. But I know it was several. It was, Russ talking about, I remember when Russ was a little squirt. Where'd he go? <laughs> he had a hard time getting up that step while ago. <laughs> and I think I got up easier than he did, and I'm a lot older than he is. I'm the oldest speaker here today, or this whole week for that matter. But he says, from the least of them to the Greatest of them, that's either the youngest to the oldest. That includes everybody, if God was including this group, but he's not including this group. He says, I'll forgive their iniquity and I'll remember their sin no more. When did that take place? Got one minute to do this. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts, well, yeah. <laughs> I got to skip part of this. <laughs> I've done throwing out my notes anyway. If you haven't figured out, I am a farmer, by, now, by the way. And uh, we farm the corn and beans down there. And Alan's got a few. Where's he at? He was, oh, there he is. And Lisa's there, too. They had a, old Sal had pigs the other day, and we're going to have to leave tomorrow because uh, a hard man, uh, his mother, died Friday. So uh, we got to leave tomorrow afternoon. So, uh, but he had, a, old Sal had pigs, and he, and, Jay's going to take care of them uh, this morning and tonight, tonight and tomorrow morning too. And we'll be home tomorrow evening. So, uh, so we know a little bit about those things. Turn to Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. Hmm. What day of the month would that have been? Been in the middle of the month. It have been the 50th day after Passover. Or, uh, yeah, after Passover. So they was expecting this, wasn't they? They was anticipating this. It was fully come. There was all of a sudden there was a sound. It wasn't say it doesn't say there was a wind. It says there was a sound as of a mighty rushing mighty wind. Now down home, when we see those rushing mighty winds and that corn's about eight ten foot tall, you get kind of concerned about it because what's it going to do with it? Over she goes, and it don't come back up. And so far, it hadn't done that this year, down home. And coming up here, once in a while you'd see some that had done that, and it's lordy, and it come like that. It elbowed and come up. Did you ever drive, drive, try to drive a combine through something like that? You got stalks sticking up here, and some over here, and some there, and they're all going, to, and they're going like this all the way through there. Well, that's fun. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Not the corn stalks, these people here. <laughs> and there was Jews dwelling out of every nation of the heaven, under heaven. That's verse 5. They was ready for the, what day? The Passover. No, they was waiting for Pentecost. But what happened on this Pentecost? God offered them his new covenant. And many people say that, well, you got to go to the book of Acts in chapter 2 to find the things that we are to do today. 
Well, now, if he said he was going to do that for the nation of Israel, and Russ gave us that verse in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, that God who cannot lie, if he gave it to Israel, who's he going to give it to? And he said he was going to give it to Israel. So is he going to do that or is he going? Or did he lie? He didn't lie. The one thing a man can do that God can't do, uh, he is a tremendous liar. Can you find anybody can lie better than man can? And I haven't. So what was he going to do? He was going to write it in their hearts. What did they say? Hold everything. We don't want that man to reign over us because they knew after that there was a king coming. And they didn't want him. So what did they do with him? They made him a crown out of things like this. And have you ever run something? I doubt you have. You ever run one of them in your hand? That smarts for a long time. There's a little poison of some kind on them. That's a black locust tree, if you want to know what it is. If you cut that thing down, there's going to be ten grow up over here and ten more on this side of it. The thing, you just can't hardly kill it. It takes chemicals to get rid of it. And some of them pretty well, they'll kill everything else too around there. But God told Israel he was going to do that for them. And that's who he's going to do. Who's going to do that for So as we look at these scriptures, we see these things. The day of Pentecost was fully come. Look in 2, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You remember he told them he was going to write it in their hearts? When these people were together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, where did God say he was going to gather them from? All nations, didn't he? Did Israel, did England do that in 1948? No. Do they, does Israel, have they ever had all their land yet? No. Hmm. But it says that they was all together in one place and they had one mind. How many times have you, there's 120 people there. Get 120 people in this room together and see if you can get them all to say, agree on the same thing. They didn't, you know, if 60 of them was men and 60 of them was women, they didn't all marry the same person. And they didn't all have same, even have the same name, did they? Did they drive the same vehicle? No. So God had to be do something, being doing something there. He did it for the nation of Israel. Until they said in Acts chapter 7, we come to Stephen... And he gives them the history of the nation of Israel. And he says, well, you get down to verse 51 in Acts chapter 7. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Well, that's pretty strong language, isn't it? Can you imagine standing up and somebody, if I stood up here and told you that, what would you do? First thing you'd do, try to find a rotten egg or a rotten tomato or something. Maybe a rotten watermelon. That'd take care of him. You stiff neck and uncircumcised heart and ears, you'd always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Whatever God wanted, Israel didn't. They didn't want a thing to do with that, did they? Whatever God said, how many of the prophets did they persecute and finally kill? All of them, every last one of them. So when we get down to the end of it, after that, they kill him. They stone him. But there was a man come on the scene. His name was Saul of Tarsus in verse eight, or at chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Well, this man, Saul of Tarsus, was one that changed. God used him to change the whole program. We're living right here. They were living back here at that time and until the Apostle Paul came along. Now, who, according to prophecy, was supposed to come over at that time? 
None other than Antichrist. Look in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out, threatening to slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Man, this guy looked like a fire-breathing dragon, didn't he? I mean, he could burn you right now. He could have you put to death, too. And God reached down, and the Lord spoke to him on the road to Damascus, and it changed his life. Look in verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go, He's talking to Ananias, by the way. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. When have you ever seen that order prior to that written in the Scriptures? Gentiles first and Israel last? Have you ever seen that before? Did you ever think about that? Well, what's happening? Something's changing. He got him a John Deere. <laughs> He'd been a drive no international. Guess what contractors we got? <laughs> Things changed. What happened to this outfit that God gave up clear back? Where are we at? John the Baptist, David, Moses. Back over there. He gave them up, set them aside. Romans chapter 1. He gave them up, he gave them up, gave them over to a reprobate mind. You know what a reprobate is? It don't even sound good, does it? <laughs> well, if you want to know what a reprobate is, go to, to uh, Romans chapter 1, start with verse 28. And you'll see what a reprobate mind is. And you read the newspaper today and what's changed? Not one thing. But God said, I'm going to offer that reprobate my plan of salvation. And as the Apostle Paul began to proclaim the Word of God, go to Romans chapter 1. After God got done with him, and he showed him how great things he's going to suffer for God's holy namesake. It says in Romans 1, Paul, a servant of God, of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. He was separated unto the gospel of God. He was an apostle. Now, this was that same guy that was out there, and he was going to put these people to death because they believed that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. God said, I'm going to, Told Ananias, I'm going to show him how great things he's going to suffer for my name's sake. And he did. God showed him, and Paul suffered. Did he ever quit? Well, let's go on. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Well, let's... Uh, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Now, how many has he got? There's two of them, isn't there? What's happening with this word? What's happening to this gospel? It's starting to get bigger, isn't it? It's spreading. All right. Let's go to Romans then. Or uh, first second Corinthians. Let's go to Second Corinthians. What's he doing with this? We've got the Word of God, and we've got the gospel that's given to him. And it goes to Gentiles. But it didn't start until Acts chapter 9. Well, what happened to Acts chapter 2? Well, let's look in 2 Corinthians here, chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of God, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all the chaos. Oh, this thing getting bigger yet, isn't it? He says, with all the saints in Achaia, he writes here. Now go to Galatians. Let's go to the next one. Galatians, chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, 
uh, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, unto all the brethren and all the brethren which are with me, unto all the churches of Galatia. Now, he's apostle by the will of God. Now, notice that he says, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. This thing's getting bigger and bigger, isn't it? What was this supposed to be? Go to 1 Timothy. Chapter 1. This is one of those faithful sayings. Verse 15. This is a faithful saying. 1 Timothy 1, 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Does that mean he's the worst one? No. He was the leader in a rebellion against God. You remember he was a, breathing, a fire-breathing dragon? He was going to go out and kill a bunch of other people because they believed that Jesus Christ was who he said he was? He says, I'm the chief of these sinners. I was the leader of it. Now, if you get a Indian chief, is he the worst one? No, he's the leader. He tells the rest of them what to do. What was Saul of Tarsus doing? He's telling the rest of them what to do. Wasn't he a Jew and a Gentile? In Philippians chapter 3, we find that he was a Jew. He was a Jew of the, uh, uh, Hebrew of the Hebrews. He comes from a, a small, the small tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. But in Romans chapter 16, after he and Silas were preaching the word, they got thrown in a, in a slammer, didn't they? They was down a dungeon. And they beat the socks off of them. Now, Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen. I was born a Roman citizen. You don't just do that to a Roman. But they had. <laughs> what are we going to do now? <laughs> they wanted to get rid of him. But he was a Jew and a Gentile, and he had come to the Jews and the Gentiles. And now we're seeing this. Let's see what it says here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which are the hope. So he was a, an apostle <clears throat> because of the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to be very thankful that Paul was as ornery as he was, that God used him. Let's read verse 16 now in 1 Timothy. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now, if he was to show the, us a pattern, what would we have been had he not become the Apostle Paul? Where would you be if it weren't for the Apostle Paul? I'll guarantee you wouldn't be here. What would you be doing if it weren't for the Apostle Paul? I don't know. But I wouldn't be here. And I wouldn't be telling you about what the Lord Jesus Christ did for me. For this rotten old rat. Well, that brings us down to one other thing. Perfection. What does Paul talk about? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I like this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. How many of you women have got up in the morning, looked in the mirror and said, Oh, you beautiful, perfect thing. How many of you men ever told? Oh, I better not say that. One. <laughs> told her she looks like that. <laughs> no, you look. Your hair looks like an explosion in a silo, <laughs> going everywhere. And, and you say, man, if you enter an ugly contest, you at least come in second. <laughs> and the men aren't much better. But he says, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. We're perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught, come to nothing. What's the wisdom of this world going to amount to? 
Nothing. Now, I've learned a little bit about corn and soybeans, and I know how it grows. And, I, and if we put God's program into mind, it works. And guess what you get? You get more and more each time you do something right. Do something wrong and see what happens. <laughs> it don't work. Turn to uh, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. When Samuel was approached by Israel and they said, we want a king like the Gentiles have. He was very distraught. He was, he was about ready to give up. And God said, well, go ahead because they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. That kingdom of priests up until this time there at Pentecost, they said, Lord, without at, again at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. Who had Israel's king been up until this time? From the crossing of the Red Sea and so forth, who told them what to do? The Lord himself. He was their king. But in verse, uh, in chapter 16 and verse 7, but the Lord said unto Samuel, after King Saul was chosen, he stood head and shoulders above every man. He was a lot bigger than I am. He was tall, dark, and handsome. I'm short, fat, and ugly. <laughs> but the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. If I ran for political office, you think I'd get elected today against a guy six foot six? He might be dumb in a box of rocks. <laughs> but he'd get elected, wouldn't he? Why? Because he's taller, and he's probably good-looking, and he ought to be fat either. Okay, but the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, ladies, when you look in that mirror, you're looking on the outward appearance, aren't you? But God sees you as what? perfect. Husbands, when you look in that mirror, what does God see? A perfect individual on the inside. Because of what he has done, not because of anything I did, but because he did it. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And verse 3. Well, let's start with verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Several years ago, Brother Jordan gave me that as a uh, topic here. What does it mean when they bewitch you? They have tried to resurrect something that God said was dead. When the Lord on Mount Calvary died... What else was crucified on there according to the Apostle Paul? The law. What was the Galatians? There's some Gent uh, Jews trying to follow around Paul and trying to resurrect the what? The law. God declared it to be dead. It started on Mount Sinai. It was born there. It died on Mount Calvary. Don't ever forget that. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently sent forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the law of the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? When you comb your hair, when you shave your face, uh, Rodney, you forgot to get all of it. <laughs> Kenny, you, you did too. <laughs> Anyhow, when you do that, you're looking at the flesh, aren't you? And we're trying to make it look as good as we can. Now, some, some of us had a harder time than others. But uh, God sees us on the inside. 
and I'm glad of that. Are we made perfect by the flesh? What does the Word of God say? Are you made perfect by the flesh or by faith? What you believe? What you believe? Go to Philippians chapter 3. If Philippians chapter 3, verse 15. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect. Oh, is he quite a bragging? No. He's talking about the spiritual condition we're in. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. What's the mind that we're supposed to do? Look at verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Can you get any higher calling than that? I used to run track. I'd run 110.5. Well, I still can. That's minutes instead of seconds, so. <laughs> but I got a prize at the end of that. I got a ribbon that said a, a first. Where are those ribbons today? I have no idea. They probably burn up. Mom probably burned every one of them. But this prize for the mark, or I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. When I went across that mark down there, I broke a ribbon. They had a mark, a string or something. But I got a ribbon for that, and it's gone. Would anybody even back in that same high school I went to know that I run 100 that fast today? They don't even know who I am. Does it matter? No. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus mine. We're perfect inside, not outside. And if, anything, uh, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. When's he going to do that? You heard of the beam of seat judgment? The gold, the silver, the precious stone, the wood, hay, and stubble? We've all got some of that. And what's going to happen to the wood, hay, and stubble? It's gone. Uh, Brother Jordan was talking, where's he at? He's talking about uh, hee-haw there. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> so, <clears throat> well, <laughs> enough said. <laughs> Colossians chapter 4, that's 12. Let's get to something really important. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Have you noticed that how we're going through this? On this perfection. It's progressing too, isn't it? Paul progressed with the message. With one person and then two and then a whole bunch of them. What's happening here? It's progressing. As we go on, it gets more perfect all the time. And the perfection takes over, doesn't it? Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervent for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now, he was praying that they would stand perfect and complete in the will of God. You can't go wrong that way. Now, this thing has built to that point. And he says, I want you to stand perfect and complete in the will of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, if you don't already know it, but now you should know it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means every verse we've read here, I don't care if it's an Old Testament, New Testament, or where it's at, in Paul's epistles, the rest of them, we haven't gone to, we haven't even touched Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's all inspired of God, and those people wrote it down. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for four things for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. What's left out? What, where do we, what else can I need? 
besides those four things? Nothing. That the man of God may be perfect. Now get this one. Throughly furnished unto all good works. Many times people say, and all the new perversions of the scripture, and that's what I call them, because that's what they are. They just, well, say it the way it is. The perversions of the scripture say we're thoroughly. Does God thoroughly cover you? If, Jim, if I had a five-gallon bucket of water here and I throw it on you, I'd thoroughly cover you, wouldn't you? But would I cover you throughly? No. God goes through you with his word, and he makes us perfect. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, <clears throat> instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, that doesn't say to do all good works, but he's unto all good works. Go back to 1 Corinthians 2. Now, this time, we're going to look at verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. Now, I told you my pages would stick together, and then Apostle Paul's epistles, they really stick together. How can a man be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works? Have you ever noticed the last phrase in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? But we have the mind of whom? Christ. That's how we're perfect. That is what God has done for us. I don't care whether you drive a John Deere or a, a whatever, Ford or whatever. It don't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of a car I'm driving. If God was so concerned about all of saved people, and you hear this all the time on the uh, media, TV, evangelists, and so forth, you give all your money to me and God's going to bless you. He is. I think I'm going to be broke. <laughs> What's going to happen? And that's what they try to tell you. God's going to bless you. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places already. How much more can God bless you if he's given you every blessing he's already got? Now, I ain't very smart, but I know that's not right. But as God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, and we have the mind of Christ, how was Christ's mind perfect? Got four seconds. It was complete. We're complete in Him. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the time we had around Your Word. We pray that it might sink deep within our hearts and our minds, that we might live perfectly and complete in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.